So the, the reason why I became quite passionate about this was actually a conversation I had with my wife earlier on this year. Um, I've got two daughters. Both of them have gone off to university this summer. And we were talking about what they do with their future. And, da -da 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 -da. and I said, how would you feel about them going into procurement? And she said, get stuffed. No way I want them going into procurement. And you sort of think, hang on, this house. Actually, we were on holiday in Koh Samui at the time, on the beach, you know, and it's like, you actually don't think that this is a good career for our children to go into. So it's really interesting in terms of how are we going to attract people if someone that actually understands the benefits there might not even think it's that attractive. So I thought, thought do people understand exactly what it is that we do? Um, and then the market, what's out there, what are the challenges? Where do we get talent from? And what can we do? What happens if we don't win that war? And what can we do next? And it's interesting, Paul, your point. Because you said it's really difficult to go out and attract uh, experienced people. And that's the trouble. Because we all try and attract experienced people. One of the challenges, I think, and talking to some of the recruiters when I was trying to recruit someone recently, was I said, no, one's no one has recruited and trained people in their first jobs for the last seven years. Budgets got cut. You know, along came the global financial crisis. Budgets got cut. Everyone wants to buy the finished article. And then you get into the conversation saying, well, of course, our people won't actually start looking at a candidate unless you're going to pay them at least £40,000. Now, if you're talking about someone second year, third year into procurement, and they're going to want £40,000, and you're looking at your budgets and thinking, how are we going to manage what we've got to do with the resource that we've got and with the budget? That's where the war starts really needing to be won. So there are challenges because organisations need to be lean. There's the focus on core competence. They have to be agile. They're flexible. They're scalable. Um, they need to engage effectively with third parties because increasingly it's third parties that are key to our organisation success. We don't do it all in-house. Um, Agile organisations, it's interesting, there was a, I missed the session this morning, I apologise for that, but there was a, a, a very, very interesting article that's been published by the Hackett Group about Agile organisations, available on the GEP website, if you want to get hold of it. And they talk about the three things that successful Agile organisations need, and it's culture, leadership and talent. And actually, when you think about it, without talent, the rest of it just isn't going to stack up. So, let's think about, I thought this was very interesting. So this was the, uh, the Reed salary survey. Average purchasing salaries in the UK, £39,886. Now, bearing in mind the average salary in the, the UK is 27000 This is not an unattractive career. And I think probably the rest of you are going, it's a long time since I was only earning £38,000 a year. So I, I think, you know, we, we know that financially, this is a rewarding career. But in terms of trying to attract people and letting them understand, why is it that people say, oh yeah, one of my daughters, she wants to study law. I'm saying to my wife, hang on, average salaries are less in law than they are in procurement. And you're telling me that you don't think it's a good idea to have a career in procurement. I think the other one wants to go into HR. So, if we are to attract talent into procurement, we need to think about what we're doing and how we sell it as a profession. How do we get those people wanting to come into procurement? So you think about procurement, us as a profession, what are we? Policy police. Process driven. I can see lots of process driven people here. Nice square boxes. Two by two matrices, we all love those, don't we? Systems managers and administrators, negotiators for contracts, managing contracts, risk managers, talked about risk management earlier on. And I think the business sees us as blockers and bureaucrats, which fundamentally is boring. We're seen as boring. However, how many of us spend most of our time actually solving problems, quite complex problems for organisations? 
Hands, show hands. How many of you spend your time? Exactly. Managing change. Making change happen in the organisation. Persuading people about the benefits of doing things differently. Managing relationships, not only relationships with suppliers, but actually internal relationships as well. Because we sit there as this layer that interfaces with the whole of the business. And quite often it's us that are able to go and engage. There was a, a good session earlier on talking about uh, IT and marketing and who was responsible for digital. But actually, procurement sits and engages with both of those. And we have that opportunity to actually talk to both and pull them together in, into collaborative relationships. We simplify things. We try and make the difficult easy. We collaborate. We are, by the very nature of what we do, we have to collaborate. We have to collaborate with suppliers. We have to collaborate with internal stakeholders. And we connect those people together. Deal internationally. I mean, I, I was working out the, the other day. I think with work, I've been to 26 different countries visiting suppliers, negotiating. Fantastic opportunities. And so many of our young people... You know, they're going, oh, yeah, I'd really like to go and travel. I don't know. Here's a, you know, here's a way you can do it and get someone else to pay for it. <laughs> and innovators and inventors, we create solutions and we look for bringing in innovation from outside the organisation, from all those suppliers that we deal with. And they're coming, oh, we've got this idea, but it's really difficult to engage with you as an organisation. And coming through procurement, we're saying, actually, that's because you're talking to the wrong person. The person you need to talk to is, I will set it up. I will enable that to happen. And for me, you know, boring? No. I think, I've been in procurement now 31 years. And I was asked this morning um, by someone, said, do you like what you do? And I said, I love what I do. Don't always love where I do it, but I love what I do. And we are a people profession. We are only as good as the people that we are able to attract into our business and that we, we need to have the best people to be able to do that. Because if you are someone that's very, very process driven, do the, uh, you know, I'll do what it says on the tin and that's enough, then you're not going to be doing this stuff here. And those are the people that we need. Those are the people that we need to attract into our profession. So, think about the world we're, we're in today. The, the market that we're out there and what's actually driving that and what uh, the things that we're trying to deal with. We're all chasing the same people. We're chasing the same people from procurement, but actually marketing and finance and sales and everyone else is trying to, to, to go for those same people. They want bright, uh, alert, enthusiastic people. We've got changing attitudes. The things that we would accept and we would do and what we were looking for when we were first leaving university or first starting out in this profession is different. The world's a very different place. Willingness to invest in training. Do we have that willingness to invest in training? We used to. You know, there used to be very structured training programmes. Increasingly, is it there? Now, one of the things looking forward is this new initiative about the, uh, the new um, apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships. We're all going to get taxed. You aware of this? We're all going to get taxed for an apprenticeship. Why don't we actually make sure we're using that money for ourselves rather than giving it to someone else? So think about the willingness to invest in training. Uh, Brexit, loss of freedom of movement of labour. So how is that going to impact on the enthusiasm for people to stick around in the UK and, uh, and actually work? Or bringing talent into the country that we need? Because if we can't find it here, where else are we going to get it? We've almost got full employment. You, tr you actually have a look at the employment figures now, and there are, we, we've got a higher employment than we've ever had before in this country. And we've got that shortage of key skills, as we know when we're trying to recruit. Average graduate UK salary, 29,000. Going into a job, first job is 29,000 pounds. That's what they, they're going to be expecting to be paid. Unless it's my daughter's and then it's a lot more. <laughs> Aging population. Some of us uh, are getting there sooner than others. Uh, but that's going to put increasing demands because, you know, uh, from one of the things Freightliner does is we have a large road fleet. And we have lots of uh, drivers. The average age of a HGV driver in this country is now 56. And there's no new ones coming through. We've got to get skills all around the, 
Yeah, yeah. The most. Well, no, that, that was for a, a, a graduate uh, uh, chemist when I first started out. Um, but we've got more graduates than ever. My, uh, my, my daughter, she went into her first law lecture, her and the uh, 449 others on her course. Um, and you kind of think, some of us when we went to university, how many were in those lectures when we first started out? There's a lot of graduates out there. But are they going to be attracted to come to work in procurement? Generation Y, which there's more question mark why I think with some of them, but uh, <laughs> and their willingness to move and well their ability to move. So I tried to recruit someone recently down in Southampton. They wouldn't commute from Winchester to Southampton because that was too far. And that that question of, of not willing to actually move. But at the same time, they're saying, why do I have to? Because I can get a job where I am. So that re reduced workforce mobility whatever that was. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, no, so that's, that's regional resource capability and ability, availability, sorry. Um, that different parts in the country, people want to work in London. They like being in London when they're young, but can they afford to live there? And social attitudes to work. They're not, I think uh, these days, you've got a lot of your younger people aren't going to want to be there till eight o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night, burning the midnight oil. It's kind of, it's 5.30, it's time for me to go. And it's kind of, they know that if, they, if they're not allowed to, or they don't feel they can, they'll go somewhere else because we've got full employment. And technology, the impact of technology, simplifying the job, trying to take, trying to take away some of the boredom of the job to allow them to focus on the things that are going to create value, but actually the things that are going to interest them and make them want to work in procurement. So traditionally, and uh, it's good to see some ladies in the room actually, because as a profession, we're not very good at attracting women into this profession. Where are they going to come from? Graduate pools. So as you said, we, we, we've got more graduates and more undergraduates than we've ever had before. But how many of us have a graduate training programme actually to bring people in? Or how many also thinking about that graduate pool, sorry, I'll just go back, uh, the graduate pool. Increasingly, there's a lot of um, students leaving school at 18 going, do I want to come out in three years time with 50,000 pounds worth of debt? What else is there for me to do that can give me a rewarding career, something I'm going to enjoy doing and not have to do that? And also, do I want to go off and do that? Our ethnic groups. Now, it's quite an interesting one. I used to work for PwC. And one of the problems that they had, and this was seven years ago, was sending partners off to go and visit uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, they would be all white, middle-aged men going and meeting young Asian guys and, and girls who are going, this person doesn't represent me, I don't actually see that. So we need to be more open to where we're going to actually recruit from. And also, you know, a lot of our suppliers, increasingly, if we're looking to source from India or China, we need people that can actually engage culturally and through language there. Women, it's a good one. After having two daughters, I'm sort of very, very pro-women. Uh, and But I've always been, th throughout my career, I've been amazed at how few women are attracted to a career in procurement. And I, I'm not quite sure why, but it's almost, it's probably, it, it's, we, we, we need to have more examples of women doing really, really well. And there have been, but I don't think they're well publicised. And I don't think a lot of girls actually see that there's a good career for women in procurement. And we need to make that something that uh, they don't, so it's, it, the interview panel is always made up of white middle-aged men. It's going to be very difficult to convince them that actually this is a good place for a woman to come and work. The alternatives to university, actually having structured training that means that they don't have to take on that debt. <coughs> Some of the best people I've ever recruited have actually been people that have known the organisation and were almost on the verge of leaving, but actually have come from finance or engineering or marketing because they actually like the idea of working in procurement eventually when I've sold it to them. Um, but they know the organisation. 
and they've got all those connections within the organisation. External transfers. So one of the things is bringing people in from other organisations. I know that uh, there's a consultancy that I, I was chatting to who they actually have a training programme with themselves, a large retailer and another organisation, which I can't remember, and they actually recruit graduate trainees together and then migrate them around and then they offer them a job at the end of it. But also think about suppliers. Could you source from suppliers or could you actually do placements of people into suppliers to actually get a different exposure? And then thinking about your network. So how do we use our network, not just the connections that we've got, but actually that wider network to actually attract people into the, uh, the organisation? And then think about what they're going to be like. Not money driven. Well, they want money, but it's not the be all and end all. They're very socially aware. So the issues that we were talking about earlier on in here about uh, thinking about the reputation of an organisation. What is your organisation's reputation like? Are you an attractive brand for them? They're connected, so they talk to each other. They're ambitious, so what, what they want to know is how they're going to take your job in three years' time, which I know is probably something that we've all had to deal with, but uh, actually managing expectations. But those expectations are there. Immobile. So the, the cost of actually living in the South East is so great now that actually there's fantastic talent, but actually if we can't move people down, can we move the jobs up there? Can we use the technology to mean that we don't actually need to all sit in the, the office together capricious, they will change their minds. They will decide they're going travelling or whatever. But actually, do you say, right, see you later, or do you say, right, have a 12 months of convent? What have you got to do to try and keep people in the pool? Educated. So as we say, you know, we've got more graduates than ever. These are bright people. These are bright young people. And they want to use all that knowledge and training. And they're challenging. They're not... It used to be much easier to manage a workforce because people used to kind of do what you asked them to do. Now they're asking, well, why do you want me to do that? What do you want me to do? Why do you want me to be here? Why, why can't I do that? Why, can't, why have I got to use this? Why can't? So it's a little bit more challenging than it used to be. But I think that one of the things is if we're going for the sort of people that are going to help us deliver the sort of organisation that we need. We don't want robots. We need people that are challenging. We need people that are educated and questioning and uh, that are connected and are socially aware and aware of what's going on out there. So, what can we do? Do nothing. Because that seems to be where we are. Or we do something. So what's that something to be? Professionalise. I think that one of the things is when you think about us as a profession, we still are creating generalists. Most professions have specialist subcategories within it. So if you're an accountant, you can be a tax accountant or you can be an auditor or a management accountant. But if you're in procurement, you're in procurement. And that perhaps we need to think about how do we create opportunities because there are different competencies of people and how do we create the profession that allows them to, to, to build and use those competencies more, most effectively? Creating career paths. So working in SME, it's very interesting working in SME rather than a large corporate. Very different. So a large corporate, you can kind of lay out, this is your plan, this is what we're going to do for you, blah, blah, blah. If you work in an SME, Increasingly, what you've got to say is, this is your career plan. By the way, I'm expecting you'll probably do only two or three years of that here. I'm expecting that in three years' time, you'll probably want to move somewhere else. But I'm going to help you get from here to here. Now, if you're lucky, you might keep them for longer. But rather than take an attitude of, we'll lose them so there's no point, it's kind of we've got to accept that that's going to be the way it is and, uh, and work with them and just get the most out of them while they're there. And creating opportunities, so moving people around, giving them a variety of experiences. One of the great things, and I think about working in SME, is if you work in large corporate, it tends to be you will be 
not only an IT commodity manager, but you'll probably be some either a software or even more niche than that. It may be retail software commodity manager. If you're working in SME, you'll get a lot more exposure. Or in, uh, in large corporates, you've got to make the opportunity to migrate people, move people around, transition them through, give them exposure and help them develop and so that they feel that they're getting something out of the, uh, the contract with you as an organisation. So how, And then we need to sell procurement. So how do we go about selling procurement? Internships. How many of you take on interns during the summer? And how many of those interns come back and say, yeah, I'd really be interested in having a career in procurement? Probably about 50% of them. That's 50% more than you would have had. Yeah. So giving people that understanding, exposure of what's possible in procurement is, um, is something that I think is really useful. And, of course, they're cheap. Graduate programme. So once again, coming back to this, this idea of the, the new apprenticeships, using that to actually create your graduate programme if you don't have one. Or if you've got a graduate programme, is procurement involved in it? Or is it the usual thing? It goes from marketing to finance to sales, and then they try and make up their mind about what they're going to do. Maybe engineering, uh, if, if you're in that kind of business. Engaging with local universities. So one of the things that... I've started doing is actually reaching out. There's a lot more of them than there used to be and explaining about procurement and actually talking to their careers advisors about procurement, not because we've necessarily got a job for them, but just to explain what's available there. Mentoring. And one of the things that's quite powerful about the mentoring, um, PwC was very good at this, but uh, is when you get... When you leave or they leave, the people that I've mentored in the past, I'm still in contact with and still coming to me for advice and guidance and suggestions about what they should do. And the, the, the good thing is that one of the guys that I mentored a number of years ago, he's now working for me again now at Freightline. And do we explain our role properly? As we said, there's that perception about what our role is. Do we ever go out and explain exactly what we do and the fun bits of what we do and the interesting, exciting bits that we do? Because procurement people tend to be quite introverted, generally. I can tell that because you're all very quiet. But we're not people that go out and bang the drum and say how great we are and what a fantastic job it is but actually if we want to get people coming in they've got to be aware of what this is as a career and what the options are and what the potential is and as I say the modern apprenticeships that money is going to go out the business now we as procurement people hate seeing money go out the business being wasted so it's a fantastic opportunity to actually engage around that and actually the uh, is it SIPs, SIPs at the moment there's discussions with SIPs about what the procurement modern apprenticeship should look like. And I'd suggest that all of you make contact and try and find out what that looks like and how you can shape that for your own organisations. So, what can we do? Professionalise. Create a graduate training programme. Training contracts. Mandate professional qualifications, MBAs. Segmentation of roles and the new apprenticeship. So around this, do we put people on training contracts? Bring them in. So if, you're, if you work for an accounting firm, you come in on a training contract. You have to pass the training at the end of that or you're out the door. We're just so grateful for having found a body that is still breathing to come through the door that we like, you know, just accept them. But that's not really professionalising where we need to be. And is it going to be attracting people to, to feel good about the profession and actually going to get the quality of people that we need in? And then creating a career plan, so segmentation of the roles, rotation of staff, placements in other departments, or even suppliers. So putting people out on secondment into a supplier for a week, finding out what goes on there. What's it like to deal with procurement from the other side? 
and having templates for possible careers so that if someone says, what does my future look like? You've actually got something you can say, this is what it could look like. Here's where you could go. This might not be within this organisation, it might be somewhere else, but you can have a great opportunity and a great career. And that guiding the staff on the next step, so the mentoring process. Really important, I think, that particularly for... The one thing I would say about... Uh, I can only speak about my daughters, is that they've got a fairly good idea about what they don't want to do, but they don't necessarily know what they do want to do. And actually explaining to them about what their opportunities are and what that could look like is really important. So then, creating opportunities, mentoring, PDPs along the career development path as well. So actually progressing and making sure that they're, they're achieving what we want to, them to do. Uh, creating excitement. I, I'm very excited about my job. It's a very ex exciting time at the moment for us. We've just been taken over by an American company. There's lots of change in the air. Uh, we're changing systems, uh, we're changing processes, and the last four jobs I've had have all been similar. I think, particularly you guys, at your level, you should be excited by your roles and you should be creating excitement for the people around you. And giving the opportunities to lead, actually giving responsibility to people. We have that in our gift, to actually say, right, lead on this. It might be lead on a particular project, or it might be lead an activity, lead training for the department, whatever it is, but actually give them opportunities. Give it early. So they're talking to their friends about, actually, I got to do this. You're only uh, doing audits and you're going in, you're spending three years going in at six o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, counting numbers. I've just been out and negotiated a multi-million pound contract. And supporting staff effectively as well. So empowering them, supporting them, and helping them deliver to their capabilities. They're going to have to be criticised, but I think that so long as you do it in a way that you let them learn, I think that's very positive. And reward and promote good achievement. So the same stuff you'd be doing in any role, any, in any organisation. So what's the consequences of not acting if we don't do anything? We won't deliver the services that our customers are saying. Uh, we're seen as a blocker. If we can't do it or we can't support the business, then they'll get someone else. And, of course, the business already thinks anyone can buy stuff. Um, we can automate the, the, the actual purchasing process. They'll then say we don't add value. Why do we need procurement? Save money and get rid of procurement. And I've actually seen that in organisations already. So if we don't address the challenges that the organisation faces, if we don't get the talent in, there won't be procurement in a few years' time. So in summary, are we a function or are we a profession? The, uh, the people out there have choices. We say it's almost full employment out there. How are we going to get the best people to come into our profession? The business needs what we do done. If we don't do it, someone else will. Probably not as well as we do it, but they'll get it done. And really the question is, as a profession, as you as individual professionals, what are you able to do to actually help procurement win the war for talent? Thank you.